The average person touches their face two or three thousand times a day, three to five times every waking minute. As the worldwide outbreak of coronavirus began to dominate the news, some people stocked up on hand sanitizer or face masks, some people bought up all the toilet paper in their grocery stores, and some people rented a movie. I really need you to get off that bus. Listen, it's quite possible you've come in contact with an infectious disease and that you're highly contagious. What? What? Do you understand? Contagion, a 2011 Steven Soderbergh film about the outbreak of a deadly virus, has climbed the streaming rental charts. This is a particularly direct example of something that's been true for decades. Movies about deadly viruses and disease outbreaks can tell us a lot about our real-life fears, and maybe help us process the growing panic and confusion we all face. That map only shows what Andromeda could do in the hands of an enemy. Enemy? We did it to ourselves. At the same time, when do pop culture depictions stoke mass hysteria rather than easing it or adding anything productive? Approximately 1 in 12 people on the planet will contract the disease. If we look at a variety of these movies together, we can track phases of movie outbreaks which exist on a continuum, examining our fears with different levels of urgency, realism. Somewhere in the world, the wrong pig met up with the wrong bat. You ever seen anything like this before? No and horror. Here's our take on what we can learn about pandemics from the movies and how they can help us deal with the anxiety. No one honest answers. Do you have any idea what's going on out there? You're watching The Take. Thanks for watching and be sure to share and subscribe. Just as viruses themselves can mutate into different forms, viral outbreak movies have different levels of severity, ranging from realistic... We'll set up triage outside. FEMA can handle food in the basement. And we'll need to be operational within the next 24 to 48 hours. ...to fully apocalyptic. Contagion, everyone's go-to reference point for the coronavirus outbreak, is the most prominent recent movie that operates in the first phase. Movies that are mainly about the containment phase of fighting a pandemic. So don't take your helmet off! Keep your helmet! Casey, keep, keep your helmet on! Other movies in this category include 1971's The Andromeda Strain. If we're eliminated, the aircraft and pilot will have to be sterilized. Oh, uh, wait a minute. That's not what they told me just incinerated. And the 1995 hit, Outbreak. You have to love its simplicity. It's one billionth our size and it's beating us. These movies all follow various professionals as they rush to contain or halt the spread of a scary new disease. <laughs> These films contain plenty of horrific moments that drive home just how easily this new virus spreads from person to person. But by playing out these nightmarish scenarios with a semi-realistic tone and a logical overview of the situation, pandemic movies in this category offer a form of catharsis. On day one, there were two people with it, and then there were four, and then it was 16. It's a billion sick. Three months. And that's where we're headed. When a real outbreak like coronavirus occurs, we are often left refreshing our news feeds for updates that trickle in about the number of cases, fatality rates, and development of vaccines. Even though some virus movies include the points of view of victims or their families, like the Matt Damon character in Contagion. I'm sorry, your wife is dead. No, I mean, I, I, just, I just saw her, we, we, we were just at home. They also offer a detailed look at what scientists and other officials are doing in the middle of the action. What's your single overriding communications objective? We're isolating the sick and quarantining those who we believe were exposed. Okay, good. Whether the events are fully realistic or not. You'll have to take us out with you. These narratives allow viewers to experience the spread of a pandemic like a test case, with a far more omniscient point of view than we get on the news. And there's a form of comfort in seeing the movie's competent or heroic professionals tackling the problem head on. Oh, Dad, you're here because you stayed in your practice treating sick people after everyone else went home. You took that chance every day. Rather than issuing misinformation, 
being caught without a plan, or not taking bold actions to prioritize public health. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle, it will disappear. Look at the newly repopularized contagion, a relatively bleak and realistic version of this story. Does she have Before? a history of seizures? Right. No, no, no. Allergies, no. other medical no. problems? Uh, uh, she's, she, I think she's she allergic to recently? penicillin. Her head no, 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 no. She came back from a trip. Okay, let's Jesus. get some help. Bat but because director Steven Soderbergh takes his trademark brainy, sometimes clinical approach, the panicky scenes are portrayed matter-of-factly, and the hopeful scenes where scientists work on a solution feel more authentic. We tried using dead virus combined with several adjuvants to boost immune response. And? No protective antibodies, a lot of dead monkeys. The story even continues well after the development of a vaccine for its fictional virus, exploring the logistics of how the cure would be distributed to such an enormous population. We shall now begin the drawing. First MEV1 vaccination are those people born on March 10th. By rationally working through what seems like a worst-case scenario, these movies are often able to devise a plausible best-case scenario where at least total catastrophe is averted. We're reassured by our ability to carry on. Would you go through again? Maybe. Now that I have the antibodies. In movies like Contagion or Outbreak, the sickness looks relatively familiar. Hey, mister, are you gonna eat the rest of that cookie? No, you can have it, Sheriff. It may be far more contagious or deadly than what many of us are used to, but imagining extreme versions of a very bad fever or flu gives us a starting reference point. Pandemic stories of the second level go further with the diseases themselves. These viruses can rob people of their senses, like in blindness. I can't see. What? Somehow that patient I saw yesterday must have infected me. Or Perfect Sense, a movie where everyone on Earth simultaneously loses their senses one by one. First overwhelmed with grief. And then no sense of smell. Or they can rob people of their mental acuity, causing violent, maniacal, self-destructive outbursts as seen in The Crazies. <laughs> or The Happening. The changing physiologies of these Phase II virus movies represent a major shift in what it means to be a so-called normal human. She's crazy, man. She's got the bug. These viruses complicate the relative simplicity of phase one infections, which usually involve getting sick or not, and then getting better or not. Phase two infections are likewise destructive and potentially irreversible, but they also go beyond the boundaries of traditional sickness to change the fabric of humanity. Whether through altering the physical or mental makeup of human beings, or through reshaping society and the unwritten rules for how human beings live and behave. I think it's okay to panic now. And that's basically what the world does. Meanwhile, unlike Phase 1 infections, whose means of spreading at least have a familiar logic, many Phase 2 pandemics spread even faster because the symptoms aren't tied to traditional sickness, and the means of infection might not be anything we've seen before. Something in this field could be releasing the chemical into the air when there's too many of us together. In George Romero's The Crazies, much of the movie is spent in confusion over who might be infected and who's just reacting to the panic and madness around them. The whole thing's insane. How can you tell who's infected and who isn't? This isn't just civilian panic either. The doctors, scientists, and soldiers are just as loud, angry, and disgruntled. It just amazes me at how shoddy this operation is. Even when the experts do have insights that could help, their voices are drowned out in the chaos. Listen to me. Listen to me. Will you listen to me? I'm Dr. Watts. I'm a scientist. I'm with the team. I got a cure for Trixie. Gone is the comforting, competent expertise of the professionals of phase one. A basic shared understanding of humanity is erased. <laughs> Enter the zombie movie. In phase three, instead of losing a part of their humanity, victims lose all of it, becoming undead monsters who cannot be cured. 
unless a bullet to the head counts as a cure. The original version of The Crazies in 1973 was directed by George Romero, who defined the modern zombie movie with Night of the Living Dead and several sequels. Oh! Though the Night of the Living Dead series doesn't portray zombieism as originating as a virus, other movies since have crossbred Romero's zombies with his The Crazies style epidemic. Movies like 28 Days Later, Planet Terror, and World War Z explicitly make zombieism the result of a communicable plague. Meanwhile, the zombie plague keeps spreading, and we do what we can. Early in the TV series The Walking Dead, there's hope that the characters might find a zombie cure. I'm sorry this happened to you. Which underlines how ultimately the walkers are victims overtaken by a terrifying disease. Like the stories in Phase 2, these narratives emphasize our fears about the unforeseeable, potentially catastrophic effects of a mysterious new illness. Infect it with what? In order to cure, you must first understand. Infect it with what? Rage. And how it might permanently alter our collective humanity. The death or survival binary of phase one is further erased because death is everywhere. <laughs> In zombie-related narratives, you're lucky if death is painful but swift. More of the time, it's agonizingly inevitable. I'm gonna eat your brains and gain your knowledge. And crucially, death is no longer the worst thing imaginable. It may be a salvation from a far more horrendous fate. I can do it myself. No. No, I have to. Well, I still can. In Romero's zombie sequel, Dawn of the Dead, the zombies lurch around a suburban mall, performing a bizarre pantomime of their living routines. These days, images like these read as eerie portraits of society transformed by illness, nightmare versions of a post-quarantine society where the sick are destructively wandering through familiar environments forever altered by their illness. With zombie-related pandemics, the worst of humanity is empowered to emerge. I promised them women. <sighs> if there's anybody out there, anybody, you are not alone. Early in 28 Days Later, the protagonist wakes up in a hospital to find what looks like an empty, deserted London. Hello! He eventually finds both survivors and hordes of marauding zombies infected with a so-called rage virus. But for a little while, he seems like the last man on Earth. Hello! The natural result of a world ravaged by a virus and overrun with zombies is a world that eventually isn't overrun at all. Phase 4 virus movies focus on smaller and smaller groups of survivors. Sometimes it's just one survivor, singular, as with the Richard Matheson novel I Am Legend, which has been made into three movies with three different survivors who think they're the last man on Earth. The Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price. <laughs> the Omega Man with Charlton Heston. And I Am Legend with Will Smith. Listen, uh, I want you to stay here on this one, okay? Because you can still get infected. Like in many Phase 3 stories, the pandemic in Matheson's tale has resulted in both global deaths and victims who have transformed into non-human creatures. In this case, both vampires and modern zombies. <laughs> But the different versions of I Am Legend emphasize solitude more than other zombie movies. Hey! Morning, Marge. Morning, Fred. Other humanity-eliminating disease stories don't even leave zombies in their wake. Twelve Monkeys takes place partially in a future where mankind has been decimated by a devastating virus and the last survivors are driven underground. <laughs> It Comes at Night is about a family living in paranoid seclusion after a similar global pandemic. The door was open when you got there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then who opened the door? Stephen King's novel, The Stand, later made into a TV miniseries, catches the virus earlier, chronicling the breakdown of society and extinction of around 99% of the world's population. There'll be no running away. 
Though the hero of I Am Legend does hope to find a cure, some other Phase 4 movies treat containment or cure as fantastical matters. And possibly play an important role in returning the human race to the surface of the Earth. In 12 Monkeys, world leaders have resorted to time travel as the only viable method for stopping the virus. No mistakes this time, Cole. In Phase 4, the threat of characters catching the disease is usually past. As with Phase 3 virus movies, they more often invoke a fear that we won't be able to band together as a society and that disease will bring out the worst in people. But the problem is now bigger than that. What if there isn't any society left at all? Phase 4 pandemic stories explore our deepest fears of loneliness and forced self-reliance. What's really important is that, that if we can't all live together and be happy, if you have to be afraid to walk out in the street. If there's anything scarier than needing to rely on the kindness of strangers for survival, it's the idea that there will be no one left to even talk to. Uh, not my color. Let alone help. I am insane. And you are my insanity. <laughs> the abandoned environments of I Am Legend or 12 Monkeys may not have many people, but they look something like the world we recognize. In the final phase of virus movies, these illnesses create different worlds entirely, whether because of species replacement or conversion to a pitiless post-apocalyptic battlescape. In these movies, the virus is more of a backstory. Though the first Resident Evil zombie outbreak is a virus, antidotes are constantly elusive or malfunctioning, mentioned in between shootouts and chases. How much of this have you used? The blood increased the creature's power. Also increased the strength of the infection. The story skips ahead to more feverish visions of a pandemic's endgame. In a strange way, these stories are more hopeful because they don't really ask audiences to imagine themselves or their loved ones experiencing the horrific and apocalyptic changes to their world. Or at least not for very long. Alice from Resident Evil just wakes up in a changed world. The audience identification asks us to focus on what we might do if we were among some of the only normal survivors. No, we're not leaving you, Kaplan. Yes, you are. No, you can't kill all of them. Or it encourages us to transcend human identification entirely, aligning us with superhumans or with another species. In the recent Planet of the Apes trilogy, where a virus that makes apes more intelligent also kills humans, we may start out identifying with the human characters, but by the time the third movie, War for the Planet of the Apes, rolls around, the only real good guys are the apes. Human, get sick, ape, get smart, then human kill ape. We're not rooting for the humans to take back the Earth. Who did I kill that night? My wife. My son. We're rooting for the apes to live in peace. Apes are strong. Maybe that's the most revealing progression of all. So many of these stories about deadly viruses, infections, and plagues turn into tales of mobs, zombies, or apocalypses. Good thing we like a challenge. One way or another, the virus goes away but it just might take our culture, our humanity, or our species along with it. Every single person that you or I has ever known is dead! Dead! There is no God. Right now, a global pandemic leaves many of us uneasy and uncertain. You will only be able to give out 50 doses today. That's our Forsythia 11! The collective anxiety the world is feeling stems from not knowing what's going to happen and how bad things could get before they get better. If you can imagine your body as a highway and you picture the virus as a very fast car um, being driven by a very bad man, imagine the damage that that car could cause. Turning to the intense, frightening scenarios of movies and TV might fuel our alarm or take us down rabbit holes of extreme, apocalyptic outcomes that are wildly unlikely to come to pass anytime soon. 
But ultimately, this exercise of vicariously experiencing the worst can also give us closure by allowing us to process the overwhelming feelings we struggle to make sense of and showing us all of the possibilities of what could happen next. <laughs> If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos.